Good day. This is Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek, philosopher, historian, and Thomas Jefferson scholar. And today I wish to address the issue of uh, whether Jefferson was the author of the Declaration of Independence. The title of this essay is, Did Jefferson Really Write the Declaration of Independence? Jefferson's energy in the cause of liberty, his dedication to the cause of human rights, and his facility with language through his pen placed him in, often at the head of over 30 committees in the Continental Congress. Yet his most significant work as member of a committee was a member of the five-man committee to draft the Declaration of Independence. And so on June 9, 1776, Congress appointed Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Robert Livingston, and Roger Sherman to draft the document. With so much occurring in the Congress, and most congressmen stretched to their limit, Jefferson was given the task of drafting the document. Why is that? John Adams recalls his conversation with Jefferson. Reason first, says he, you are a Virginian, and a Virginian ought to appear at the head of this business. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. You are very much otherwise. Reason third, you can write ten times better than I can. Now Jefferson calls into question Adams' flattering account. He writes, Mr. Adams' memory has led him into unquestionable error. The committee of five met, no such thing as a subcommittee was proposed, but they unanimously pressed on myself alone to undertake the draft. In that manner, Jefferson shut himself in the second floor of a three-story brick house at 7th and Market Streets in Philadelphia and worked on the project from June 11 to June 28. When finished with his initial draft, he handed a copy to Franklin and Adams for their corrections. The two made merely verbal alterations, and the Continental Congress received a fair copy on June 28 and made substantial edits, thereby reducing the document by some one quarter in length. The most notable omission was a long passage penned by Jefferson on the evils of slavery. The Congress was not, at the time, uh, prepared to tackle that issue. Because Jefferson was part of a five-man committee, and because the fair copy had to go through the criticisms and edits of the Congress, it's fair to ask whether Jefferson can be called the author of the Declaration of Independence. Pauline Meyer, in her book, American Scripture, The Making of the Declaration of Independence, warns against ascription of authorship to Jefferson. Jefferson was, she says, no Moses receiving the Ten Commandments from God. He was part of a five-man committee which oversaw the project. Also, Congress revised the document before its publication. Thus, it was an act of group editing. Meyer warns against regarding the document as a sacred text and against championing Jefferson as, quote-unquote, the father of all moral principles. She sums that Jefferson was, in her own words, the most overrated person in all American history. More recently, Daniel Allen, in her book, Our Declaration, a reading of the Declaration of Independence and in Defense of Equality, also argues against ascription of authorship to Jefferson. The, doc, uh, the Declaration was a democratic work that was constructed by a committee and was intended for a global audience. The document was merely begun by Jefferson as his original draft was received was reviewed by the four other members of the original committee, by 51 other members of the Continental Congress, and by the clerk, Matlock, who, in her own words, textured the text with his formal calligraphy. Thus, there was the influence of, again in her own words, the words uh, and voices of all those people who participated in conversation with Jefferson, Adams, Lee, and Mason, end of quote. In addition, one must not forget the conversations of committee members with others within and without the Congress. And so, if we follow Allen's line of reasoning, then it seems that nearly everyone with democratic leanings had a hand in penning the document. Yet with due consideration for Jefferson's meaty role in birthing the document, she sums. The monumental achievement of Thomas Jefferson is ultimately to have produced the first draft in a general argumentative structure that, through its philosophical integrity and unquestionable brilliance, could survive such intense committee work and bear this much demand for agreement. 
Now, the document was certainly not considered to be a sacred text, though it's now considered to be one, when it received the final approbation of Congress on July 4th. In agreement with Myers, uh, Meyer, its Declaration of Independence was post facto, that is, after the fact. Independence had formally been declared on June 2, 1776, and the document, until years after its acceptance, fell into what I'd call relative obscurity in the States. So its effect in Europe was immediate <coughs> and seismic. Jefferson himself was astonished by the significance of the document de de decades after it was penned. He writes to Dr. James Meese in 1825. He says, of the sacred attachments of our fellow citizens to the event of which the paper of July 4th, 1776, was but the declaration, the genuine effusion of the soul of our country at the time. Small things may, he continues, perhaps like the relics of saints, help to nourish our devotion to this holy bond of our union and keep it longer alive and warm in our affections. Now, while he wrote the document, Jefferson was clear that his chief aim, and, and the letter to me shows this, was not originality of sentiment, but to capture merely the spirit of the colonists of the time. That sentiment he expresses more plainly in a letter also written in 1825 to Henry Lee. Writes Jefferson, when forced, therefore, to redress to arms for redress, an appeal to the tribunal of the world was deemed proper for our justification. This was the object of the Declaration of Independence, not to find out new principles or new arguments never before thought of, not merely to say things which had never been said before, but to place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent and to justify ourselves in the independent stand we are compelled to take neither aiming at originality of principle or sentiment, nor yet copied from any particular previous writing. It, in other words, the Declaration, was intended to be an expression of the American mind and to give to that expression the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. All of its authority rests then on the harmonizing sentiments of the day, whether expressed in conversation, in letters, printed essays, or in the elementary books of public right as Aristotle, Cicero, Locke, Sidney, etc. So in writing the Declaration, Jefferson aimed to encapsulate the expression of the American mind at the time of its composition. Originality was not an aim. And so the merit of the document, he concedes, is its ability to capture the harmonizing sentiments of the day that the document has taken on the status of a holy relic today strongly suggests that, that Jefferson perfectly captured those sentiments. Now the document in many respects is merely a formal reconstruction of Jefferson's summary view of the rights of British America with excision of certain aspects and fleshing out of others in a tone that I think is less angry and certainly more measured. I examined Jefferson's fair copy of the declaration. First, the initial paragraph is Jefferson's opening salvo. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Now that salvo is an appeal to the good judgment of mankind for the causes of the colonists push for separation. Secondly, and most famously, Jefferson then limbs several self-evident truths, that all men are equal, are created equal and independent, that from that equal creation all have the rights to the preservation of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that governments derived, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government, are instituted to secure such rights, and that the people have a right to abolish any government which becomes destructive of these ends, and to institute a new government by, he says, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Next, and this is the lion's share of the uh, document, he lists 18 grievances 
which he says are facts submitted to a candid world. And these grievances aim to show that King George III's behavior when it comes to ignoring the rights of the colonists is tyrannical and of consistent purpose in ignoring colonists' rights. Many are taken of the grievances he lists are taken from the summary view. Finally, there's the ending paragraph, which uh, is a normative argument for colonial separation and self-government. He says, these United Colonies are, and of right ought to be free and independent states and are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown. Thus, the declaration is a lengthy argument given in just mostly in the second paragraph. All people are created equal. All people are endowed with certain rights, that is, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, to enable them to live peaceably among each other in a social setting. Governmental power is derived from the, consistent, from the consent of the people. The main task of a government is to secure its citizens' rights. When every government fails, when any government fails to secure its citizens' rights, the citizens have a right to abolish it and to institute a new government. King George III has abusively violated the British colonists' rights, and he lists the 18 grievances, so the colonists have a right to form their own government in keeping with their own notions of their safety and happiness. Examining the document, we can see clearly the influence of John Locke and certainly of George Mason. That's apparent, but Jefferson was too well read in the liberal utopian literature of his time some examples, uh, Moore's Utopia, Mercier's the, the Year 2440, Condorcet's History, Harrington's Oceana, Chiron's On Wisdom, and, and Volney's Ruins. And so I think it's vain to look too much at the influence of any one person on the document. Jefferson had uh, was well read in the literature of his day, and the influence of literature was, uh, of, was much wider. Yet, there is reason to believe that in writing the document, Jefferson merely appealed to the skeleton of his own newly forming political philosophy, which would get fleshed out in certain letters on rebellion and revolution during his tenure in France, in his first inaugural address as president in 1801, and in certain letters later in life, the year 1816 is especially revelatory, on the notion of sound Republican government. Jefferson writes to William Fleming, just prior to ratification of the Declaration, and this is on July 1, 1776. If any doubt has arisen as to me, my country will have my political creed in the form of the Declaration, etc., which I was lately directed to draw. This will give decisive proof that my own sentiment concurred with the vote they instructed us to give. There can, I think, be no stronger statement of ownership, of authorship, of the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.